Okay, so looks like almost everyone is here. And so let's continue. Um, so today most likely I won't be able to finish uh, this chapter. All right, so we will still have to um, spend another class, which is on Thursday, right? So pretty much, yeah, this week we will finish this chapter. And after that, we will, again, we'll go back to uh, this, those Hamilton's principle and <laughs> stuff like that. Right? Okay, so where we finished in the previous class. So we uh, introduced differential cross-section in general. So which relates intensities of scattered beam and the intensity of an incident beam, right? And then we actually, we derived in the expression of formula, right, um, for sigma, right? And in order to use that formula, of course, we needed to know the relationship between the impact parameter and the scattering angle. So then we derive that relationship, that formula uh, in terms of some com complicated integral, right? So that's what we needed. And then uh, as an example, we just uh, decided to derive a Rutherford's formula, which is basically uh, charged particles scattered on a charged particle. So target is, a, is another charged, part, charged particle, right? Uh, so basically a uh, scattering of again, charged particles on, um, on a Coulomb's field, on a Coulomb's field, right? So that's what we started uh, discussing in the previous class, right? And of course, first we started with that integral in order to find the relationship between the uh, scattering angle and the impact parameter. And we actually managed to get it, All right? So let me uh, just write the result, of course. All right, so we get this, we got this. So S, the impact parameter equals to uh, k z z prime so finally i fixed my notes because in in my notes in in a few places i just forgot about this k okay all right so i just z z prime and e squared but k was not there and as a result as i told you a couple of times in my lectures i forgot about that k so then uh divided by uh two e n times a uh, cut tangent of the scattering angle theta divided by two. So that's what we um, <coughs> derived in the previous class. Again, relationship between the impact parameter and the scattering angle, because you remember those are two major parameters that we need to uh, discuss scattering. And of course, we decided that we're going to use theta as sort of our independent parameter, final parameter from the practical point of view, because you can actually measure it. Yes, yeah, it's nice from the theoretical point of view to introduce it, but from the practical point of view, but practically it's impossible to measure it <clears throat> okay so now after this of course we need to uh, we need to write down uh the uh, differential cross section right so and of course we derive the formula so now uh sigma uh okay i will write immediately as a function of theta equals and in the previous class we got this impact parameter divided by sine of theta i think yeah yeah, sine of uh, theta, and then absolute value of the derivative ds over d theta, right? <laughs> yeah. And you remember, we put this absolute value artificially because every time uh, derivative ds over d theta is negative, because if you increase s, theta goes down, right? And of course, differential cross section cannot be negative. So in order to just dump that negative, uh, that minus, we just put an absolute value, right? right? Okay, so now we just need to plug it, right? This into here and uh, see what we can get. So K, Z, Z prime e to the power of two, then uh, divided by two e, I'm just writing instead of S, all right? And then cotangent, let me write it in terms of cosine versus sine. Right, cosine of theta over 2 divided by sine of theta over 2. And divided by this sine. And again, let me use a trig identity. Sine of theta, it's a 2 times sine theta over 2 times cosine theta over 2. Right, so that's this part. Now, absolute value of this derivative. 
derivative okay these constants still here mm, okay let me write them okay z z prime e squared over 2e okay and then derivative of cotangent it's a negative one over sine to the power of two All right so it will be minus sine uh, squared theta over two and then of course uh, one over two because we're differentiating with respect to theta and here we have theta over two so one over two will pop up right so that's uh, seems like a correct derivative okay so now uh, what we need to combine a few things and we can actually cancel a few things all right so cosine and cosine goes and let's count start counting signs one sine second and here two so we have four power fourth power of sine squared um okay i guess i can uh, immediately yeah and minus of course will disappear because we put an absolute value okay so i can actually write sigma uh, as a function of theta will be equal one over two no this i will combine with that so it will be one over four just this and that so it will be one over four then this constant k z z prime e to the power of two divided by two e uh here and here right to the power of two then what else what left what else left uh, okay it's just a sign right one over oops one over sine to the power of four theta over two okay guys if you notice that i made a mistake somewhere just tell me right don't wait until i humiliate myself completely right so let me check my notes yeah that seems to be correct right <clears throat> so that's what we're getting that's the differential cross section which is basically gives us all uh info information about information about how uh, particles are distributed in terms of angle right so angular dependence so it depends on the scattering angle right okay so now after this uh if you um sort of important things we discussed Okay, started discussing, of course, repulsive scattering, right? The repulsive scattering. Uh, so, for example, positive particles on positive particle or negative particle on negative particles, right? Uh, okay, negative particles on a negative particle target. All right. In that case, uh, this uh, Z, Z prime will be positive all the time. But since this whole construction is squared, so it doesn't matter if you have repulsive scattering or attractive scattering differential cross section is going to be exactly the same it doesn't matter if you uh <clears throat> if you're sending i know electrons on uh, some positively charged target or negatively charged target distribution of scattered particles will be identical right <clears throat> okay let me mention this because it's kind of words of mentioning um okay so sigma is the same okay probably i should have uh, written sigma as a function of theta dependence on theta will be the same of course uh, for an attractive and a repulsive potential for an okay so attractive at attractive and repulsive cases right and of course it's uh, because of that power of two maybe i will emphasize so it's because of that square right. then uh, yeah probably uh, let me just sketch of course what will be the um difference in terms of geometry right so let's say this is target and of course um repulsive repulsive would look like this right scattering but attractive look like this so uh, attractive case and 
repulsive case. But again, distribution of particles on our uh, detectors are going to be exactly the same. It doesn't matter. <coughs> then, what else is, is worth of mentioning? Ah, uh, yeah, again, it's, <laughs> I already mentioned it twice, right? Uh, because we are uh, getting into the sophisticated world of quantum mechanics with our gigantic, tool, gigantic tools of classical mechanics, right? But the thing is, <coughs> This formula, if you use a quantum mechanical treatment, you will get exactly the same formula. So classical uh, approach and quantum mechanical approach by accident, yeah, by accident, uh, leads to exactly the same uh, formula. Right. Okay, nice. Right. So you, sometimes even gigantic uh, classical mechanical tools uh, works fine in the sophisticated world of quantum mechanics. So it happens, right? All right, um, yeah, probably I should write also. <clears throat> uh, quantum mechanics will lead to exactly the same formula. Uh, quantum mechanics, or oh, quantum mechanical treatment, uh, leads to the same formula. Right. Okay. So cool. And of course, yeah, it was derived in 1913, right, uh, to explain Rutherford's um, uh, experiment. Quite a, quite fruitful year, right? Uh, Federal Reserve was created. IRS was created at the same year, and Rutherford's formula was derived. That'd be cool, right? So now, um, next. Uh, let's calculate the total cross-sectional, right? Uh, and uh, total cross-section. And of course, in order to do that, of course, we need to integrate over all theta capitals, not theta small, that uh, um, spherical angle, no, theta capital scattering angle. We need to differentiate over all, I mean, integrate, sorry, integrate over all um, scattering angles, right? So. Now uh, let's get, I will put a, new, a small bullet, uh, total uh, scattering cross-section. So let's get a total scattering cross-section. Right. And of course integrate over all scattering angles right so let's label it as sigma as a function oh i mean s sub t sigma s uh, sigma uh, sub t and of course integration of sigma op d omega solid angle right all right uh and and um Let's, you know what, uh, sigma has this complicated constant. Since at the end we will get some interesting results, let's put it this way, and which does not depend on that constant. Let me just call this constant as some C, constant C, right? Maybe yeah, let me write it this way. I will open my explanation box and write that sigma equals to some constant C, all this mass, divided by sine to the power of 4 theta over 2. Right. Okay. And of course, the omega, uh, when we started discussing scattering situation, scattering problem, uh, I wrote down on that uh, complicated uh, diagram the value of uh, the omega. <laughs> right. So it will be integral of uh, c divided by sine to the power of 4 and the omega it's a 2 pi sine theta d theta right so that's the omega solid angle and again we integrating over scattering angle you you remember when we, again in the first class of when we started discussing uh scattering problem I showed that the minimum value of theta is zero. Maximum value of this scattering angle is pi. 
zero it's uh, when there is no target or the impact parameter is gigantic right and pi is when particle experience a and uh, a head-on collision right and of course it bounces back so it will be from zero to pi okay so now uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to write this using trigger identity. Rewrite this using trigger identity. So it will be uh, 2 sine theta over 2 times cosine theta over 2. Right, so this instead of that. And as a result, 1 sine and here 1 sine will be cancelled. Right. As a result, we will end up with integral okay let me take c okay 2 pi c outside 2 pi times c outside and then ah 4 pi there's another 2 4 pi c right and um okay cosine okay let me do it step by step cosine theta over 2 times d theta and divided by uh, sine to the power of 3 theta over 2. Okay, so now, of course, we need to take this integral. I will divide this by 2, multiply by 2, so that my variable of integration will have the same structure like uh, variables in our functions, right? Of course, as a result, we will get here 8 pi c and uh, integral of what? Of course, cosine I will take inside of the differential. So it will be uh, d sine theta over 2 divided by sine to the power of 3 theta over 2. Of course, the limits from 0 to pi. <coughs> Okay, and so, uh, of course, this integral, um, yeah, I need space, and I'll guess, I will, uh, and I have to move up here, not enough. I thought I will be able to squeeze it, right? So, it will be uh, minus 8 pi c divided by 2, and... Uh, sine to the power of 2, of course, in the denominator, right? 1 over sine to the power of 2, theta over 2, and the limits from 0 to pi, right? So if you, if you differentiate, of course, you will get, get rid of that, minus will disappear, and you will get the third power. Yeah, that's correct. And, and the lower limit... I want to say ruins everything, but that's <laughs> what we're getting, right? Um, so there will be, of course, minus eight. Okay, you can see it's go it goes to infinity. I just don't want to rewrite it one more time. Of course, the upper limit is not, it does not give us infinity, but the lower limit leads us to infinity. Right. So it goes to infinity, right? So uh, total cross-section is infinity. What does it mean? It means that all particles that you sent for scattering will be to some extent scattered. All of them. Even those uh, which has a uh, gigantic, very large impact parameter. Still, even those particles will be slightly deflected by the scattering center, contributing some, giving some contribution to the total cross-section. Of, uh, of this problem. So that's what it means, right? Infinite uh, cross-sectional, cross-section. And it's a consequence of the fact, consequence of the fact that the Coulomb force, of course, it's a long range force, and it extends all the way to infinity, of course, um, giving some deflection to all, all particles, right? So let me write that down. And of course, and of course, right, in real life, it's a, basically, that's how we model. We basically model it, model the situation, assuming that we have a, a nucleus, right, okay, charged particle, um, and there is nothing around, 
and of course then also particles uh, which um, which are being scattered but in the real life of course uh, if there is an atom as your scattering center of course that atom has some uh, orbital electrons right and of course those electrons they are going to shield the charge of the nucleus to some extent and as a result the um, potential uh, real life potential doesn't extend all the way to infinity because of that shielding. All right, uh, so we usually model uh, this type of potential, more more realistic potential using your cover, you cover potential. Right, you've you've seen it, right? You've used um, in some problems. Problem would say, let's assume that we have your cover potential and let's calculate something. Blah 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 blah. And basically, your cover potential was introduced to a model. <coughs> more realistically uh, in this case like scattering of uh, uh, charged particles on uh, more realistic um, atom Re more realistic atom right okay so but let me write a few words about this uh, infinity and then right uh, so what I um, so it means that so first small bullet it means that all particles will be scattered all particles okay are scattered even with uh, infinitely large impact parameter. Even when S equals to infinity, basically. Right? So all particles. All right. Um, and of course, they all contribute to the total scattering cross-section. And then this, the second, of course, it's a consequence of uh, infinite range of the Coulomb force it's um, a consequence of an infinite range of uh, the infinite range of the Coulomb force or Coulomb potential, right? Of um, the Every time when I have to write Coulomb, I have to pause uh, and um, sort of realize which uh, last name I have to use. Because in the in the STL where I, I, I used to work, right, on my PhD, right, so we had Mike Coulomb, and his name, last name, is Coulomb, spelled was uh, spelled differently. So now every time when I have to write Coulomb, I have to um, <clears throat> recall which spelling I have to use. Right? Uh, Coulomb. Uh, force right okay so that's um uh, the interpretation of these results and of course um maybe i will write um but in a real atom Uh, the charge of the nucleus is shielded by atomic electrons. Let me write, but in a real atom, um, the charge of the nucleus, okay, nucleus is shielded. Okay, I missed E, shielded by the atomic electrons or orbital electrons by the atomic electrons and the total cross-section is finite and sigma is finite but if we use just a Coulomb potential without including electrons, of course, it's uh, infinite. Mm. 
Okay, so that's what I was planning uh, to discuss. Pretty much now, as I told you at the end of the previous class, once we derive those formulas for sigma and the formula for which allows which allows us to get a relationship between s and theta at that point physics is all almost over so you just grab the potential whatever potential you want to use in order to model this or that scattering put it in those formulas differentiate integrate right whatever is needed right and then at the end when you get some results you can of course you can spend you can start spending tons of time and analyzing uh interpreting results right but between um but at, uh, till the last moment when you get the answers right just a pure math right physics is not there right only interpreting the results yeah it might be uh complicated right <clears throat> okay so that's enough uh, again in your homework there will be i don't remember if i gave you you cover potential i forgot i need to change i i need to check right but anyway it's, it's somewhat in terms of mathematics it's similar to what we have done in the previous class and uh, just now right and even i think integration you'll have to do the same that's why i dragged you in the previous class through that integral right Right. Because I know how students don't like um, integration. Okay, so now, uh, what will be next? Um, we need to derive the real theorem. It's sort of like a, not directly connected to what we've been discussing, right? It's sort of like a let's digress because, yeah, in some fields of physics, it's important. As I told you, like in astronomy, they like that. Uh, a lot like Dr. Cook a few years ago even asked on the qualify exam to state that the real theorem. All right, so let's prove that. And then at the end of this class, we will start discussing circular orbits. So basically, when are they stable, unstable, or uh, when um, they are closed, if you disturb them, all right, are they going to be, the trajectory is going to be open or closed, right? So uh, questions like this, right? Okay, so now, uh, as a preparation to start deriving the real theorem, uh, let's refresh uh, what is homogeneous function. Right? Because we will need it uh, maybe like in 15 minutes. And also we will need these results uh, later on. Right? So let's um, sort of preliminary, um, yeah, as a preparation, uh, let's refresh what homogeneous function is. And... I guess I should be able to fit it here. Okay, so now I can, of course, separate this. Okay, done with scattering. And, and so now, uh, homogeneous function. So I will put a new bullet, right? So now homogeneous uh, function. Just basically mathematical idea, right? Homogeneous function um, of, uh, of coordinates. Yeah, probably I will write of coordinates. I just wanted to, I thought about, should I write of degree k? Because it's very important. Let me write of degree k, homogeneous function of degree k. So what does it mean? So it means that if you take some parameter t or any other parameter and multiply each of the arguments x1, x2, x3, and so on, by the same parameter t, then the value of the function will be multiplied by the factor t to the power of k. Okay, let me write that down. So if we have some function f, which we think is homogeneous, right? Okay, maybe I will, no, I will write it here. So f, uh, let's say t x1, t x2, so function f as a function, uh, f as a function of x1, x2, x3, and so on is homogeneous if if you multiply each of the arguments by the same parameter t. Right? Then it will be the value of the function will be equal to 
t to the power of k times the function f x1 x2 and so on x i think i use n, n small yeah n small right so if this is true then uh, function f is called homogeneous of degree k of degree k okay some t is some parameter examples x squared for example right it's a x squared it's a homogeneous function of degree two right then uh, for example uh, force of gravity force of gravity homogeneous function of degree uh, minus two right degree minus two then um, gravitational potential potential energy gravitational potential energy it will be uh, it is not will be it is a homogeneous function of degree minus one the same about electric force right or electric potential right? there are plenty of um, functions which are homogeneous right so since we're going to see them since we see them almost all the time so it's worth of um, discussing it and plus as I said uh, the results of what we're going to discuss now will be used a few times in uh, in in the rest of the semester right so this is homogeneous function and now let's prove what is called the Euler's theorem another one there are so many theorems principles and so on connected with the, the with his name right it's one of them right so let's pr prove Euler's theorem I will put a new bullet, All right? So let's um, again. We will need it, All right? Only because of this theorem, of course. I, I again I reminded you about homogeneous function because we needed this Euler's theorem. Okay, so let me introduce uh, denote x i prime as t times x i right and let me rewrite what we just what i just wrote okay i will write it like this uh, t to the power of k f x1 and so on x n equals to f of x i prime we one prime and so on uh, one prime x two prime and so on right and now just for fun let's just differentiate with respect to this parameter t both sides right so d over dt of both sides right of course we will end up with what uh, k t to the power of k minus 1 there is no dependence on t inside right so it will be as a result just function f x1 all the way to xn but of course inside of this x primes of course we have t's right inside so of course we need to use the chain rule and of course it's since it's present in all arguments so of course I will have to introduce summation uh, from one to which subscript I use? Okay, i all the way to n, right? And now partial derivative of f with respect to x i prime, right? And then partial derivative of x i prime over d t. So first, uh, this derivative, last derivative, of course, it will be just x i. Right? So this will be just x sub i. And now, now, the final step. Let's apply this general situation for a very specific case when t equals to one, because we just want to get something particular for uh, for for some situation so let's look at this more general situation when t equals to, uh, equals to one right so what if if t equals to one 
because we just want to get something which we need. And so we can get that if we assume t equals to 1. Of course, it's not the most general situation, but that's what we need. And why not? As long as, as, long as it is mathematically correct. Right. Okay, so as a result, we will get that uh, k, right? Then f uh, as a function of all these axes, right, equals summation df over dx i prime if t equals 1, so x i prime equals to x i. So we can rewrite the derivative as uh, so for summation from 1 to n and then partial derivative of f with respect to x i right and then that is multiplied by just x i so that's what we need that's what is called euler's theorem right. so if function f is a homogeneous function of degree k right so then if you have this construction derivative of the function with respect to the argument times the value of the argument sum over the whole uh, arguments over all arguments and it should be equal to the degree of freedom oh not degrees of freedom degrees of homogeneity k is the degree of homogeneity times the value of the function we will see it in a few places all right so it's complete it's not completely it's not a complete nonsense right so we will see it all right, so now let me frame it. So that's what we call uh, Euler's theorem. Right. Okay, so uh, at this point we can uh, leave it because as I said, it's sort of like a preparation. So we will need it at some point. All right, so sort of like an ingredient. So we prepared it, now we can put it in the fridge and later on we will use it when we, when we need it, when we get to the correct place. All right. So now, now I can write, let's prove the virial theorem. So the Virial theorem. Right. Okay, so of course you know uh, that the virial theorem relates what the uh, time average values of kinetic and potential energy. Energies, time average values of kinetic and potential energies. Right. So let me let it relates. Let me write it. It relates. Uh, time average values, right? Um, I was just thinking about the article. The uh, time average values, oops, of um, kinetic energy and potential energy k e and p -E, kinetic and potential energy right. okay so let's assume that we have a particle i mean system of n particles point masses point masses right okay so let me draw a few particles all right so let me write um first yeah, let me write number one. And then we're going to make a few assumptions, right? So first, it's a system of n particles. Right. Uh, so it's a system of n point masses or objects which can be treated as point masses, right? Sometimes even planets, of course, can be treated as point masses. Right. So it's important point masses. And we're going to discuss it, uh, describe it, of course, using inertial reference frame. So let me uh, show it here somewhere. Right. So we have uh, inertial 
reference frame. We will we'll see at some point we will use, uh, as a result, we will be able to use something, right? Inertial reference frame is important. Of course, position of particles can be defined by the uh, position vectors Ri, right? Of course, there will be some forces acting. Why not, right? F, I's, right? Okay, so this is just the system. Now we're going to make two assumptions. First one, uh, which one should I mention first? Uh, potential energy. Potential energy is a homogeneous function of degree K. That's why we need this. So let's assume that potential energy is a homogeneous function of degree K. So let me put this two. So assume uh, potential energy is a homogeneous function of degree k. Looks like at some point I need to change marker, getting lighter and lighter. Right, and then what else? Ah, yeah. And another assumption, we're going to assume that our system, this system of n particles, um, basically executes its motion in a finite space. So it doesn't go to infinity. For example, it means that the results which we're going to get is not applicable if you want to describe, for example, uh, the Big Bang. Right? In that case, in that system, so the system goes to infinity, right? So uh, this, as a result, the virial theorem is not applicable for some explosions, right? So only for systems uh, which move um, in a finite uh, region of space. Okay, which way I wrote it here? Um, finite region of space, yeah. So then, um, so it moves in a finite region of space. Of course, at some point, all these uh, assumptions will be used. Right. Okay, so now that's uh, basically the beginning, right? And now uh, we can start deriving it, trying to try to derive it. Okay, so now, just for fun, let's introduce this strange looking uh, function, which I'm sure that you've never seen, right? Uh, um so okay let me just write let's introduce oops intra introduce this strange looking function g right which is basically you take a linear momentum of one particle dotted it with the position vector for example this has pi Okay, P1 times uh, dotted with R1, then P2, R2, P3, R3, and sum these products over the whole system, right? From summation from 1 to N capital. So this is I, right? Again, uh, I don't know any value of this function, right? Of this construction, right? If it was... Uh, for example, R cross P, yeah, that will be the ang that would be the angular momentum, right? Uh, here, I don't know any physical value of this function. So, but it was if you introduce it, and of course, if you massage it in the proper way, you will get we can get what we needed, right? But for now, it's just a function uh, which was introduced for fun in an attempt to get something interesting. Okay, so now we introduce this. Okay, let me frame it. Right. Because so far it's, it's the only place where I've seen this function. And so now let's look at the dynamics. What happens to this function in time? So let's look at the total time derivative of this function g. So let's look at the dynamics. So it will be dg over dt. And of course it will be summation. Okay, I will stop writing limits. Right. So it will be uh, pi 
dot dotted with ri plus summation of pi uh, dotted with ri dot. It just differentiated it. And now it's time to use the fact that we use inertial reference frame, first of all. Since we use inertial reference frame, these are point masses, so we can use Newton's second law immediately, directly, right? So it means that this pi dot equals to the net force acting on the particle i. Okay, so that's the first. And of course, we also remember that pi, it's a mi r i dot okay vector right okay as a result uh, with this we cannot do anything so it will be just summation over i from 1 to n uh, f and the dot product of f i and r i but this it will be dot product of r dot and r dot it's a uh, v squared basically m v squared again summation over the whole system so it means that we are getting two times total kinetic energy of the system All right here it's a two times t right. maybe i should write so this will be equal to two t right so plus two times t okay great we we, we managed to get kinetic energy into this game right so now we need to, at some point, uh, bring the potential energy into the same uh, equation. Okay, so next, uh, next now um, let's look at the time average. Let's average the whole thing over time. Right, left hand side and right hand side. So now uh, take the time average. And of course, you remember what uh, what do we mean by uh, time average. For example, of any function f, it will be uh, one over. Uh, let's assume that averaging over a period of time tau, right? So it's one over tau, and then you integrate that function from zero to tau, and f dt. Right. <clears throat> so that's what we mean by averaging in time. Okay. So now we can do it. Uh, with the left hand side and right hand side. Let me do it first with this. So it will be uh, uh, 2 times t average, then plus, okay, we cannot do anything with this for now. So summation over the whole system uh, f i dotted with r i vectors, and oh, let me put it on top of everything, this bar. Actually, in this case, it's not, it doesn't matter, but anyway, let's be strict. And this, so it will be 1 over tau integral of dg over dt and dt from 0 to tau. Of course, we will get just the value of g at the upper limit minus a value of g at the lower limit. So it will be 1 over tau. Uh, and g at tau minus g at zero. So that's what we're getting on the right hand side. And now there are two situations, right? So again, with this for now, let's just leave it alone. Let's just emphasize on this. So what can be done with that? Right. So first situation, first situation we haven't say and we haven't said anything about tau and of course quite often like uh, for example uh, some some particles orbiting or planets orbiting around something right motion can be periodic and tau can be a period let's say for whatever reasons you you're interested on that so if tau is the period of motion then of course value of g at tau must be equal to the value of g at the initial moment of time and as a result this will be zero. So if tau is period, if 
tau is a period of motion. Then, of course, g at tau equals to g at zero, right? And as a result, this is zero. So, as a result, we can write that 1 over tau, g at tau minus g at zero, goes to zero. Not goes, just equals to zero. Equals to zero. <clears throat> so, the left-hand side will be zero. But what if, second situation, what if uh, tau is not zero? I mean, it is not period. If tau is not period, then of course, we will have to use something, uh, one of those assumptions. Uh, let's try to look at this finite region of space. All right, motion happens in a finite region of space. It means what? What, what can we say uh, about g? g we introduce this way. If motion happens in the finite region of space, then r, of course, finite. Then p, which is m r dot, r dot also in real life is finite. Noth nothing is infinite, right, about the speed unless uh, you live in the world of Hollywood, right? Only in Hollywood it's possible. So, r, of course, velocities are finite. So, r is finite, velocity is finite. Of course, the value of g's are finite. Again, if the system moves in a finite uh, space, right? So, it means that this will be finite. And then there is a tau in the denominator. So now, if you want to make this term zero, then it's only up to your patience. If you are ready to, if you're willing to wait long, long, long enough, if you're willing to, uh, to put tau to infinity, right? Then of course this left hand, oh, right hand side, sorry, right hand side will be zero, right? So let's. That's why this uh, condition number three was introduced. So that uh, motion happens in the finite so that we can dump this last term. Okay, not last, the right term on the right-hand side. Right. So, right, um, since uh, a motion in a finite space, then, of course, we can write, so then, then r i's and r i dots are also finite, right? And also as a result, because that's what we have here, right? So then of course g is finite, then of course g is also finite, right? And then as I said, if you wait long enough, if you average over a long, very long, long period of time, then of course you can make that term as small as you want. Again, it's only up to your patience, right? All right. Uh, so, and as a result, I can write that I can write the limit when tau goes to infinity. Again, your patience. Uh, then it will be 1 over tau g at tau minus g at zero will go to infinity. I mean, go to zero. It will go in the limit to zero, right? So basically now we're just trying to get rid of this construction on the right-hand side. So we're trying to find any excuses so when we can uh, get rid of that uh, additional term so that we will have only that kinetic energy and this construction, right? which we will take care of later. We will take care of that later. Right. So, this right-hand side is zero, and as a result, we can rewrite. Okay, let me hold my forces. So I need, I will need this. Okay, let me erase only up to this point for now, All right? And so now I can rewrite this, right? Okay, let me check if I mention everything which I was planning. Yeah, it seems like that way. Okay, so now we can write uh, the average value of t. t averaged equals to a minus 1 over 2 in the average value of this. So summation 
over i from 1 to n uh, and the dot product of the force dotted with r i. All right, yeah, that's it. I need to change marker. Right. Just afraid that it will be again difficult to erase uh, what I can write with this marker. But yeah, so basically now we can say, yeah, come on, this is the virial theorem in the most general form. We haven't imposed any restrictions uh, on forces. So right now it can be applied for whatever um, a force acts right in your system or on your system. So of course remembering that these assumptions we've made, right, except for haven't used this one, right. So but now let's uh, start imposing uh, some additional restrictions, right. So let's assume that first force is derivable from a potential. It means that force is conservative, right. So now uh, let's make first. You know what, let me first frame this, because right now it's the most general form. And now let's start imposing additional restrictions. So first, uh, what if um, F is derivable from a potential? F uh, is derivable. V. Oops, oops, oops. V, right. Okay, so basically it means that I can write that Fi equals to minus gradient. Of course, taking with respect of the coordinates on which this force acts. All right, so for example, if it's a uh, F2, then of course you have to take that gradient with respect to the coordinates of that particle number two. And that's why when I wrote down here subscript I immediately I erased it because it was completely stupid, right? <laughs> there shouldn't be any uh, subscripts. <clears throat> right. Uh, v, right. So that's... Um... Okay, so now of course we can uh, plug it, right? And we will get... Um... You know what, I will just write probably separately, right? Just this part. Right, so it will be a summation uh, f i dotted with r i. Of course, I can write it as okay summation first. Right, summation and then um, okay minus one right, and uh, gradient of a v gradient of v. Of course, I can write for example in spherical coordinates. Right, I can write it uh, r at dv over dr plus theta hat 1 over r dv over d theta and plus phi hat 1 over oi oi uh, you know what subscript i over here uh, over there over here right and there sine of theta i and partial derivative of v with respect to phi i, right? Okay. And uh, r, r is dotted with r, r hat, of course, i, r sub i. Of course, as a result, we'll have only uh, this term will survive. So we will have summation over i from 1 to n over the whole system and we will have this uh, dv over dri times ri so it's a partial derivative of v with respect to ri and times ri okay so that's what we're getting All right so now we need to plug it back and we're getting uh close to what uh, we need but you know what before i start plugging it into uh, here. Look, 
does it remind you of anything which we just wrote recent, which, which we just uh, wrote recently? It's uh, this construction. df over dx times x. Here we have dv over dr times r. It's exactly so we can apply Euler's theorem. So it's the first place where we uh, ended up with some construction, uh, with a construction similar to this. So it means that uh, we can use, right? And of course, uh, since we assume that potential energy is a homogeneous function of degrees k, so yeah, we can use it legitimately because f here is homogeneous function and v we assumed also is a homogeneous function. So now we can legitimately use it. So let me open my explanation box. Since V is a homo homogeneous function of degree K, right? So we can write it. We can use, you. okay, let me also write underneath. Let's use Euler's theorem. Okay, so it will be uh, k times v, right? Of course, v is a function of r, of all those r's, right? Okay, so now, now we can plug it back. And of course, now since I use Euler theorem, I can <laughs> uh, start erasing this. Okay, so now as a result, I can write that down. t uh, average value minus 1 over 2. Uh, k and the average time average of a v. Okay, now it looks more and more uh, familiar. Because, yeah, uh, you've seen uh, virial theorems, of course, in the past. Did we drop the negative sign from the uh, from like the second part? Ah, okay, hold it, hold it, hold it. No, 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 minus, 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 must, must disappear, right? So, yes, okay. This minus, and thank you, thank you, right? Although you still waited until I humiliated myself. <laughs> yes, <laughs> because this minus must be uh, here, right? And that, uh, this minus, okay, this minus, with that minus, um, must remove each other. Okay, okay yeah. So, all right. Because I started thinking about, again, homogeneous function and minus disappeared from my mind. Yeah, so now it looks much better. Right. Okay. And now I can erase this. And so now the final push, right? Uh, we need to apply it for, of course, um, for the force in which we live every day, right? Um, so, but first uh, let's uh, write it for um, potential of this form, All right? So now apply for, for example, V equals which form? A times R to the power of N plus one. Okay, so uh, in this case, uh, K is N plus one. So it's a homogeneous function of degree K plus, well, N plus one, N plus one. So in this case, it's a k equals to n plus 1. And of course, the virial theorem will look this way. So it will be 1 over 2. Um, yeah, n plus 1 divided by uh, n plus 1 divided by 2 times the average value, time average value of, of v. And so now, yeah, for our, for the gravitational case, all right. So if a V equals, which constant I use? A, A over R. So basically it means that uh, N equals minus two, N equals minus two, right? So in order to get that N equals two minus two, of course we can uh, have the virial theorem, which uh, we use most of the time. So it will be t, time average value of t. Now minus appeared. Now minus will appear. So when n equals minus 2, we will get minus 1 over 2 uh, times uh, average value of potential energy. 
right? So that's what most of the time, and that's what most of the time we use, right? And of course, astronomers use because they work most of the time with uh, force of gravity, right? <clears throat> okay, one of the uh, examples where this can be used, right? Of course, there are tons of them, right? Although when you work in the photonics wor world of photonics, right, <laughs> you don't use that often, right? Um, okay, this example, which uh, when I saw it, I liked it, right? So, uh, electrons, an electron in an atom, of course, it can jump between orbits, right? And let's assume it jumps from a higher orbit to the lower orbit, sort of from uh, an orbit which is farther away from the uh, nucleus to the orbit which is closer to the nucleus. So what will happen to the potential energy in this case? Of course, potential energy goes down because it dives deeper into the potential uh, well, potential well, right? So let me draw the situation. I think I should be able to squeeze it here. <clears throat> so let me put a new bullet. Example. So we just look at this, uh, the process of uh, electron jumping from the higher level to the lower level. Of course, we will we'll have to talk about a change in the potential energy and change in the kinetic energy. So of course, we can write it as delta. Delta T equals minus 1 over 2 uh, times delta V. Right? So we can rewrite it as delta T time average equals to minus 1 over 2 times delta V time average right and let's apply this right <clears throat> so electron uh, which we have wrote it uh, changing orbit okay in orbit so let's say we have uh, here the Nucleus, nuclei, All right? Uh, and then uh, let's assume that we have these uh, two orbits, right? So let's say this is the final and this is initial, right? And the electron moving from here to there, right? So of course this is initial point and this will be our final point, right? transitioning so of course this is the final this is the initial so v final and v initial of course you remember potential energies are negative right so as a result in this case of course delta v v final minus v initial of course negative right and potential energy is negative so minus from there, minus from there, give us a positive kinetic energy. Great, right? So your kinetic energy will go up. But it looks not like, but, but uh, only half of change in the potential energy goes into the change in the kinetic energy. Usually, okay, in classical mechanics all the time, right, uh, no, physics one, so potential energy changes and it goes into the um, kinetic energy. Of course, if there are no any losses, but of course, we don't have any losses. But in this case, uh, uh, of course, this virial theorem doesn't explain where the, the rest of the energy goes. Of course, we know, right, uh, but of course, you have to apply some additional uh, analysis in order to justify that actually that additional energy uh, will go into the emission of a photon. So when electron jumps from this level to that level, only half of the change in the potential energy will go into the kinetic energy, change in the kinetic energy, and the rest, the other half, will go into production of, uh, of a photon. Right. So this... Virial theorem uh, tells us that there must be something else. Of course, it doesn't tell us that photon will be produced, but it tells us, guys, look carefully, there must be something else over there. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so now I can write a few things. So delta T will be, okay, first of all, positive, right? So kinetic energy does increase 
So let me write. So when electron uh, loses potential energy, only half of it goes goes uh, in goes uh, in into increase. Okay, let me use, write just delta t goes into delta t. All right, and so the other half. Okay, the rest goes into the emission of a photon. of a photon. And again, uh, this virial theorem doesn't <laughs> tell us there will be photon, it just tells us there must be something uh, else, right? <clears throat> so we need to uh, analyze in a slightly different way in order to come up with that, with the appearance of the photon. Okay, so that's a virial theorem, right? Again, it's sort of not uh, naturally connected to the rest of what we've discussed, but again, since it's uh, in some fields of physics, it's important, so I felt like uh, we should discuss it. Like, so let me check what else. Oh. Okay, so now after this, Uh, let's start discussing circular orbits, <clears throat> right? And uh, yeah, as I said, we're not going to use virial theorem to analyze circular orbits, but I think we're going to use Euler's theorem uh, to analyze circular orbits. <clears throat> and um, so what we will have to get, so under which conditions of in which um, and the presence of which forces we can have circular orbits, right? Because, because not all uh, forces can uh, give you a circular orbit. So right then, uh, under which conditions that circular orbit is going to be stable? So if you disturb it, is it going to uh, get back to that circular orbit or it will just fly away? And the last piece which we're going to analyze, under which conditions uh, circular orbit is going to be closed if you disturb it, right? If you don't disturb it, right? So of course the uh, particle will just fly in a circle. But if you disturb it, of course it will, uh, and of course if it's stable, right? Circular, st stable circular orbit, of course if you disturb it, of course it will start sort of like an oscillating around the circular orbit. So we need to get the conditions when this disturbed orbit is closed. So if you started from this, if it started from this point, after maybe one cycle, uh, one cycle or two cycles, or maybe more cycles, it will get back to exactly the same point, closed orbit, right? So we need to get uh, this. Uh, we need to answer these questions. So under which conditions this or that will happen? Right. Um, and again, it's kind of useful because sometimes, yeah, solving uh, the problem exactly, completely difficult, but you can at least analyze uh, the uh, analyze circular orbits. You can analyze circular orbits and this analysis is reasonably simple, reasonably simple. Okay, let me just at least start. Right. All right, so circular orbits. Okay, all right, so uh, at the beginning of this chapter, we uh, derived that second order differential equation, which we have to use in order to get a trajectory of motion, or we could, uh, we can use also that integral, which we actually used to uh, discuss scattering process. Okay, let me remind what we got. So we got this, right? So m r double dot uh, plus or minus l squared over m r to the power of 3 equals to uh, 
force, right, F as a function of R, right? So it's so that second order differential equation, which you can solve. Actually, in this case, of course, you will get R dependence of, of R on T. But of course, if you massage it, you can get equation for the trajectory, all right? You, of course, if you replace theta, with, I mean, uh, T with theta, we've done it in an undergraduate level course. <clears throat> and the second uh, alternative, second option, of course, you can use first integral of motion, which is conservation of total mechanical energy. So it will be mr uh, dot squared divided by 2 plus L squared over 2mr squared, right, and plus potential energy, whatever potential uh, you have. So we have these two uh, options. And, and so what if we have circular orbit? So what's so special about for circular orbit? Uh, for a circular orbit, R dot equals zero. And of course, R double dot equals zero. And of course, don't get confused. R double dot and centripetal acceleration. Those are two different things, right? So circular orbit, of course, there will be centripetal acceleration, but R double dot is zero. And as a result, as a result, we can get from the first equation, and after this, we will finish, right? So uh, then, if we, of course, apply that, of course, we will end up with, all right, so F, ah, yeah, orbit, orbit, radius of the orbit. So let's say uh, R equals to R naught. Okay, so then, of course, as a result, you will end up with F at R naught will be equal to minus L squared over M R naught to the power of three. So what we can get from this equation, first of all, yeah, your force, central force, must be equal to the centripetal force, which is obvious, right? Then, second, minus indicates that, of course, that force must be a force of attraction. Of course, obvious. If, the, if you don't have a force of attraction, circular orbit, impossible, right? But what is also important, <clears throat> this equation allows us to get L. Because usually L, when you plan some mission, right, something, right, uh, L is your initial, determined by your initial conditions, right? So from here, you can get the value of L for a particle or for a planet, right? So that uh, that object would circle with the circular radius R, with the radius R naught. So from here, we can get the value of L, right? We can get L for, of course, that circular orbit. And from the second equation, of course, okay, let me rewrite, of course, this is zero. This will be L squared over 2MR naught squared plus V at R naught, right? So this equation is going to give us the total, again, total mechanical of energy, because again, this is determined by your conditions, right? So again, L you get from here, plug it here, L, right? And then this equation, uh, this expression give us the total amount of energy that your system must have in order to be in a circular orbit, right? So here, uh, we get total mechanical energy for a circular orbit. Oops, orbit. Oh, what a mess, let me rewrite it for a circular orbit, right? Okay, so uh, let's finish over here, right? So that's how we can easily get um, the value of L and the value of E. Mm -hmm.